They enable the movement of ideas. The value of the conference was beyond just the week. You get to get your message out to so many people. It's really a very clear statement about the position for Toronto. It brings a diversity of talent into the room. Toronto and Collision are hand in hand. Can't wait to come back next year. What do we need to do to ensure that technology doesn't make the world a worse place? These companies have incredible power. You've got to hold the companies to account. The tools that we've created have been turned by others into weapons. We need to do a better job of creating a really safe and inclusive workplace. Build teams of people who believe in something bigger than just what they're working on. This is hope. The number one thing every investor can easily fall into is being in your own bubble. This is one of the best places in the world to come and step outside of that. Venture's uh, interesting because you get many different types of investors. You see like a congregation of 70,000 people, but actually you get to spend quality time with the venture community. Web Summit's massive. I mean, the ability to sell our vision to a crowd of 18,000 people it was very cool. Every time we come here, we learn something new, something more, and, and we recalibrate. I like coming to a conference that has invested the time to make sure you've got diverse people here to network with. I think it's a huge opportunity for people who are just starting up their companies. I'd encourage every startup to get involved. Toronto had firmly arrived on the world's tech scene. In the fourth largest tech market in all of North America. There is room for everyone to succeed. We are building an ecosystem. This isn't going to happen overnight. Technology is all around us. Toronto is having a moment. We can't lose sight. Technology is great, but it's about people. If we don't come together as a people, the world will end right in front of us. Because if we don't succeed together, we're all going to fail separately. It's very important for conferences like this to exist. They enable the movement of ideas. The value of the conference was beyond just the week. You get to get your message out to so many people. It's really a very clear statement about the position for Toronto. It brings a diversity of talent into the room. Toronto and Collision are hand in hand. Can't wait to come back next year. What do we need to do to ensure that technology doesn't make the world a worse place? These companies have incredible power. You've got to hold the companies to account. The tools that we've created have been turned by others into weapons. We need to do a better job of creating a really safe and inclusive workplace. Build teams of people who believe in something bigger than just what they're working on. This is hope.
The number one thing every investor can easily fall into is being in your own bubble. This is one of the best places in the world to come and step outside of that. Venture's、uh, interesting because you get many different types of investors. You see, like a congregation of seventy thousand people, but actually you get to spend quality time with the venture community. Webzoom was massive. I mean, the ability to sell our vision to a crowd of eighteen thousand people—it was very cool. Every time we come here, we learn something new, something more, and, and we recalibrate. I like coming to a conference that has invested the time to make sure you've got diverse people here to network with. I think it's a huge opportunity for people who are just starting up their companies. I'd encourage every startup to get involved. Toronto had firmly arrived on the world's tech scene. The fourth largest tech market in all of North America. There is room for everyone to succeed. Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to the opening night of Web Summit, the largest gathering of entrepreneurs in the world. My name is Casey Lau, and I'm the co-host of Rise. And I'm Sunil Sharma, managing, managing director of TechStars in Toronto, and I'm also the co-host of Collision. We have an incredible lineup in store for you here at the opening night of Web Summit. You're going to hear from whistleblower Edward Snowden, live from Russia, to talk about his life and his decision to bring down the mass surveillance system that he helped build. We'll then have my fellow Canadian Michelle Zatlin, the co-founder of Cloudflare, and Daniela Braga, the founder and CEO of Define Crowd, to, to speak. Next, Huawei President Wu Ping will be outlining his vision for the Chinese tech giant's future. Finally, Jaden Smith from Just Water will be here on an all-star panel to talk about why water is now attracting the next generation of high-profile entrepreneurs. But before we bring those stars on stage, we have picked a selection of the most exciting startups attending Web Summit for you to have an advanced preview of throughout this evening. So let's get our first startup out. It's a very fitting that our first speaker is from Portugal. Luisa is a founder and VP of engineering at Fide, a Silicon Valley-based beyond perimeter security startup with an engineering team based in Porto, Portugal. Please give a huge welcome to our first breakout speaker, Luisa Lima. Woo! Have checked your company email from your personal phone, perhaps from the hotel Wi-Fi, or from a conference that you might be sitting at at the moment. Did you realize that it could be putting your company at risk? Companies are under attack today more than ever. There are six million records breached every single day. Each of these attacks costs on average three million euros. Can take more than 200 days to get detected. And actually, 25% of these attacks are not caused by external attackers, but rather by our very own internal employees. It seems that secure access is broken. How did we get here? Well, work used to happen only at the office, and our employees were there, sitting together with the company servers. But Nowadays, we so the trust model of trust was based on the perimeter, and access was based on whether you were inside or outside of it. And for a while, this worked to block cyber attackers. But nowadays, we have a new work model. We work remotely from home, from coffee shops, and we have our company data in the cloud. To adapt to this change, the concept of network was extended to outside of the office perimeter using VPNs, which supposedly works. Well, sort of. In reality, let's face it: VPNs are slow, not reliable, and everyone hates them. And is it secure? 
Well, no, it is based on old assumptions. With VPNs, an attacker only needs to compromise one device to access the entire company network. FIDE removes the old assumptions and builds a new system based on the concept of zero trust, which means that every person and every device are not trusted, whether they are inside or outside of the company network perimeter. FIDE continuously and in the background verifies whether you are the right person with the right device and with the right permissions. It is fast and reliable, unlike those VPNs. And what about from the company perspective? Well, are you worried about privacy, compliance, or GDPR? We've got you covered. Does it really make sense to rely on 90s technologies to protect your company? Just stop doing that. Get rid of your VPN today and upgrade to easy and secure access. Thanks, obrigada, and enjoy the Web Summit. Next up, we have Veronica Riedarl, the founder and CEO of DemoDesk, a startup that is building the first intelligent online meeting tool for inside sales and customer service teams. Veronica founded DemoDesk with the vision to enable anyone to have a great customer conversation using a new kind of web conferencing technology. Now, DemoDesk just raised a seed round of $2.3 million. They're co-located between Munich and San Francisco. So please put your hands together for Veronica from DemoDesk. Good evening, Web Summit. I'm Veronica, co-founder and CEO of DemoDesk. We are building the first intelligent online meeting tool for inside sales and customer service professionals with the vision to enable anyone to have a great customer conversation. Inside sales, that is sales being done remotely via email, phone, and web conferencing tools rather than meeting face-to-face -face, is a huge and rapidly growing field. And sales is hard. Mastering the art of sales requires a unique combination of natural talent, years of experience, and strong product expertise. So why are the web conferencing tools that are being used today in inside sales still purely functional? They hardly offer anything besides plain vanilla video calling and local desktop sharing. We changed that. Time problem with the clickers here. We redefine web conferencing using a unique approach to screen sharing. Existing tools record your presenter's local desktop screen. We set up a virtual display instead that anyone can access by just clicking a link. There are no downloads required, and control can instantly be shared with anyone. By using a virtual display, we can automatically load the right presentation content at the meeting start, show real-time conversational guidance on the presenter's site, without the customer seeing it, and have significantly more data to analyze than existing tools. We are building the first intelligent online meeting tool for customer-facing conversations. Today, DemoDesk is being used by over 100 fast-growing international companies. We help our customers increase close rates, automate the entire workflow from scheduling over preparation to CRM logging, and scale the team by integrating sales coaching and onboarding right into the meeting flow. We were part of Y Combinator earlier this year and just raised our seed round. Now we're looking for great people to join the team and customers that want to work with us. Thank you. Our next company is another Portuguese startup from Porto called Barkin. They are a subscription service for dogs. Barkin delivers all products and services a pet needs online and offline with a subscription plan. Today we will hear from Portuguese founder Andre Jordão. Let's him make him feel home on stage. Okay, how many of you bought something online this year? I'm sure that almost none of the packages had a personal message inside. And why? 
I'm Andre, founder of Barking, a subscription service delivering happiness to pets with food and health combined. Say you pay us 40 euro per month and you'll receive a box with custom-made food for your dog, plus a dedicated vet, a dedicated doctor on our platform. We've impacted more than 20, 26,000 customers in Spain, Italy, and Portugal. And each month, at least 68% of our revenues come from repeated customers. But Barking is so much more than a business. It's part of our customers' lives. We've ignited local communities in 14 European cities where our customers gather to socialize every week. We make a difference by being there with communities, with a personal message from your vet and a specific recipe for your dog. And now we're taking it to a whole new level. We'll be closer to our customers and what's closer they're going into their homes. We'll be there with a smart box connected to an app that knows exactly when your dog needs a food refill or just the right advice. We present to you the Magic Box, a smart box connected to an app that assures your dog's happiness and your peace of mind. The Magic Box is an elegant and durable container for your dog's food that helps you save time plus improve your dog's health. It learns how you feed your dog, predicting the exact day and time you'll need a refill. No more clicks or checkouts. Food tailored to your dog will arrive at your doorstep automatically. Using sophisticated AI, the Magic Box also gives you advice on your dog's diet and shares personalized tips for a healthier and happier life. And all of this is controlled by you through our intuitive app. In a nutshell, true happiness in a box. Barkin, let the let magic, the magic begin. begin. Because e-commerce is becoming super cool and transactional. We're just speaking to robots. At Barking, we want to bring a human connection back to e-commerce out of a market we love with an experience made just for you. Thank you. Obrigado. Thank you, Andre. So next up, we have Casafari. Now, they track the entire real estate market by aggregating and matching properties from different sources. The platform is now used by 7,000 real estate agents and in two years has managed to increase its annual income by more than 600%. So please put your hands together for Casafari founder Nils Henning. Hello everyone, thank you for having me here tonight and re representing Casafari. I'm one of three co-founders and I'm going to show you what we do. Our mission is we bring transparency to the real estate industry. It's one of the most opaque and uh, chaotic industries in the world. And we do this by building the biggest and cleanest real estate database in the world. Why? The real estate industry is the biggest industry in the world. It's a $280 trillion industry. That means it's three and a half fold the global GDP. And unfortunately, let me see next slide. It's still stayed in analog times. So there are agencies around, there are players around who still work in a pen and paper style. They even don't have a computer. And we talked about changing this. Why? Because it causes multiple problems. Number one, you have fragmentation in the market. You might have more than 15 different marketplaces. So if we think about Spain, there might be Idealista, Fotocasa, Pisos.com, Habitat Clear, Je Cronte, um, Quiero, Green Acres, Mitula, and so on. So if you want to find property, it's a pain. 50% of the inventory is not advertised anywhere, and the complete market information doesn't exist. Chaos. 80% of properties are listed with several agencies, so no exclusivity in the market. 20% of what we see has more than one price. So watch out very, very clear before you buy a property. And classifieds advertise multiple times of properties. See in Idealista, we found one property listed more than 50 times. 
The solution is machine learning and data collection and deduplication. So it looks very clear what you know from Skyscanner and Trivago. This is what we built with Casafari. How successful we are in this? So we started in the beginning of 2018 on the Portuguese market. We tracked already more than 13 million properties, um, and we grow strong further in building a marketplace connecting all players, from brokers to agents to buyer agents, investors, banks, insurance companies, and so on. What speaks for us, we have more than 500 million tracked data points right now, a team of more than 70 people from more than 20 countries, and we have Lakestar and uh, Roundhill Capital, Roundhill Ventures on board of Casafari. Thank you, everyone. Have a great show. All right, our next company is a Dublin-based startup called Evervault. Founded by 19-year-old Shane Curran, Evervault is a cloud-based secure processing product and aims to take privacy away from compliance and turn it into product. Let's welcome to the stage Evervault. At Evervault, we spend a lot of time thinking about data privacy, like a worrying amount. And after all of that thinking and mulling over, the thing we discovered is data privacy is hard, and it's a massive problem. It's been estimated that so far there's been 6.6 .6 billion personal accounts hacked. That's one for basically everyone on the planet. You just have to look at the news, and this stuff is everywhere. It's impossible to avoid. And I'd be willing to bet that pretty much everyone in this, in this room cares about data privacy. It's no longer something that compliance teams are worried about and getting caught up in you know, an alphabet soup of regulations like GDP or CCPA, blah, 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 blah. It's now a feature of your product. And product teams are thinking about it from day one. And we think it should be baked into your software stack. But so far, the toolkit for doing that just really sucks. Um, we think we need privacy cages. And this is a new way of thinking about the problem that we've been working on. And we think it's something that the entire industry as a whole should adopt. And it's something that, just not, that not just us are thinking about. So what is a privacy cage? Privacy cages are basically just environments that you put your code in and they've no access to any external input or output, so everything that happens inside is totally secure. Um, after, off the back of our funding round, most recent funding round led by Sequoia, we spent a lot of time building a product called Evervault Cages. And this is something that, and, and this sort of deployment flow is something that we think data privacy should be reduced down to. In the same way you can charge a credit card in a couple of seconds, you can deploy to the cloud in a couple of seconds, we think data privacy should be this easy. But I could spend all this time talking about us and our company, but I'd much rather have everyone else in the audience just think about the problem itself. So we've written what we like to call the Pragmatic Privacy Manifesto. Um, and this is something we just published today. I won't go into detail on every single one of those headings, but I implore you to take a look on our new blog Uncaged, where we talk about these in detail. Uh, and we love to hear more, converse about this online, and keep the conversation moving. Thank you. That was great, Shane. 19 years old. Next up, we have Alina Lapisnu, the CEO and co founder of Fiscal which is a London-based fintech company whose vision is to democratize financial management for micro-businesses globally. So please welcome to the stage Alina from Fiscal. Hello. How many of you in this arena have your own business or have dreamt about starting your own business? No one. How many of you have dreamt about spending your weekends managing business finances? No one. <laughs> there are half a billion businesses in the world with less than 10 employees. About 20, th this number is set to increase by 20% over the next 10 years. The 
global economy is built on small businesses, yet they are the most underserved in terms of technology. 190 million of them use digital mobile services. Yes, most of them do not use cloud software. And 80% of them struggle with business finances. This is why we built Fiscal. We built Fiscal to enable anyone to manage their mobile finance, their finances from just their smartphone. We built Fiscal for the business owner and not for the accountant. We built Fiscal to make it beautifully, beautifully intuitive and automated. We built Fiscal to invoice in any language and we priced it for every country. And this is what fiscal looks like. You can, as a business owner, you can see your status at any time. You can invoice in under two minutes anyone in the world. And you can, and you can take payments locally and globally. Fiscal was launched just under a year ago, and we already have customers in over 116 countries. To reach our customers, we needed a strong distribution network. For this, we have partnered with a variety of companies, such as mobile operators, banks, uh, cloud and payment providers. In effect, tonight, we announced the partnership with WePay from JP Morgan Chase. Fiscal is not just a SaaS platform. Our APIs and data engine provide banks and lenders with true financial data intimacy in real time. This data is crucial to enable them to understand and better serve their customers. And if you'd like to use fiscal there is a surprise offer code web summit use it upon sign up my name is alina lapushnanu i'm the ceo and co-founder of fiscal and we make managing finances for small businesses easy and affordable for everyone thank you obrigado Sorry about our next speaker is Dee Coakley, and she, whoa, some fans out there. The co-founder and CEO of Boundless, an end-to-end -end employment solution that makes it easy for companies to handle payroll and HR compliance for their international remote workers. Let's put your hands together for Boundless. Good evening, Web Summit. A quick show of hands. Who here runs a business with remote workers? Okay, quite a lot of hands. So many of you will understand that employing people in other countries is hard. Boundless makes it easy to employ anyone anywhere. Right now, we're witnessing a major shift towards remote working and distributed teams. And many companies treat their remote international workers as contractors. But this is not compliant with employment law in a lot of countries. And it's very rarely compliant in the longer term. In a growing number of countries, the local tax authorities have been writing to companies, telling them that they must make their contractors compliant employees by the end of this tax year. So, Companies need to do this in a compliant way. But employing people in other countries is incredibly difficult. During my 10 years in COO roles, I set up payroll in eight countries, and it was slow, painful, and expensive. It was a different process every time, and it took between four weeks to 18 months to get set up in each country. At Boundless, we've spoken with COOs at 70 different companies 
and they're all looking for a better way to manage international employment. Boundless takes care of the pain of in-country setup so you don't have to. We act as the legal employer for your remote workers. We process payroll, distribute salaries, file taxes, and ensure compliance with local employment laws. Instead of taking months to get set up to employ someone in a new country, with Boundless, it takes hours. This is a huge market, and with increasing focus on remote working across all sectors, this space is set to grow exponentially over the next few years. The Boundless founding team is an experienced group of technologists, operators, and builders, united in our mission to make it easy to employ anyone, anywhere. If you'd like to know more, visit us at boundlesshq.com forward slash WS19. Thank you. That was just great, indeed. So next up, we have Safety Wing. They build a global safety net for online freelancers. Safety Wing is currently offering a travel medical insurance for digital nomads. Now, speaking for Safety Wing today will be co-founder and CTO, Sarah Sandness. Please welcome Sarah to the stage. Hello, everyone. I am going to talk about how remote work will change the world and why we need a global social safety net. Remote work simply means not having to go to an office. Whether you're an employee or a freelancer, all you really need is a computer and an internet connection. Remote work is big and it will become huge. The Economist quoted a number of 1 billion remote workers by 2035. Safety Wing is fully remote. We gather our core team four times a year, but in everyday life, we're spread across the globe. Our full team of 25 are from 15 different countries, and most of us no longer live in the country we're from. Some remote workers will stay in their home country, while others will use tools like Nomadlist to find their perfect city match. They will bring their own jobs and are just there to live and spend money. I predict a future where cities and countries will compete to get these workers to come live there. Immigration laws will change. Thanks to the internet and remote work, the world is taking huge steps towards equal opportunities, except when it comes to welfare. The, the new workforce falls between the cracks of the existing national system. This is why we need a global social safety net. A good social safety net, like the one we have in Norway, where I'm originally from, consists of health insurance, disability insurance, pension savings, and income protection. So this is what we are going to build, just for the whole world. We have proven that we can create a global a global insurance product that is innovative, and we have grown 30% a month since we launched a year and a half ago. We're just about to launch our second product, a global health insurance for remote teams, which means where companies can, where companies can get uh, insurance for all of their employees in a one-stop shop, no matter where they are in the world. We will then launch a global savings and pensions product, which will be the world's first of its kind. Then we will bundle all our products into one package, forming a complete social safety net as a membership. 
A global social safety net is a fundamental part of the global future of work. Someone has to build this. And that someone is us at Safety Wing. Thank you. All right, that was great. Our final speaker before the break is Jala Reze, the CEO and co-founder of Mutiny. Mutiny helps companies personalize their website for each visitor in order to close more sales. Prior to Mutiny, Jala was the head of marketing at Gusto, where she and her co-founder discovered the need for personalization and were inspired to build Mutiny. Let's give it up for Mutiny. The biggest problem every company faces is growth. Today, companies spend $300 billion on digital ads to drive people to their website and another $100 billion in marketing technology to convert those people. Yet, 99% of the visitors bounce because they didn't immediately understand why the product is great for them. Mutiny helps companies personalize their website for each visitor in order to convert more of the traffic um, into customers. My co-founder and I experienced this problem firsthand as early employees at Gusto. I led marketing from the seed stage, and what I realized was that while our product was a really good fit for a lot of different businesses, the same marketing message didn't necessarily resonate. Um, and as we started to try to tailor our message for each vertical, we learned why it was so challenging and why so few companies were actually personalizing their sites. So to personalize our site, we needed to know who's visiting. We needed to be able to prioritize between all the different visitor segments, change their experience, and measure the results. And to do that, we needed a ton of engineers, data scientists, designers, and analysts. There are virtually no marketing teams that have access to these types of expertise. And that's why we built Mutiny, to solve all of these problems in one place with software. Mutiny um, identifies visitors in a compliant way with uh, pre-built data integrations. Uh, it analyzes the website traffic and conversion data in order to identify the highest impact segments for personalization. Has a visual editor that lets you change any website and change the experience for a visitor. Uh, and it has built in analytics to measure the impact of personalization. All of this is enabled by adding a single line of code to the website. Our first market is SaaS. Um, today, we work with some of the fastest growing SaaS companies, such as Segment, Brex, and Amplitude. For example, one of our customers, Amplitude, a product analytics company, uses Mutiny to uh, show each visitor logos and customer testimonials based on their industry. A consumer tech company, visiting Amplitude.com, we'll see Instacart and Twitter, whereas a B2B company will see Box and Cisco. This has increased their leads by 54% because people want to know how their peers are using Amplitude. Another customer, Brex, a financial services company, uses Mutiny to show fully tailored pages to each of their customers. And that has increased their signups by 200%. So, Go to MutinyHQ.com and learn how you can turn your website into your number one growth channel. Thank you. Those are just incredible. So listen, we're going to take a short break now for 10 minutes. You can get up and stretch. We'll be back in exactly 10 minutes for another eight breakout startups. And then we're going to start with the official program. So please come back.
Welcome back to the breakout startups on the opening night of Web Summit here on center stage. Come on, let's hear some noise. There's 10,000 other people outside waiting to get in. For those of you just joining us, we are halfway through listening to the most exciting startups attending Web Summit. We have eight more to go, so let's get going. Okay, our next speaker is Rui Salish, President and Chief Operating Officer of Stradio, a company fusing automotive engineering with machine learning to drive a zero downtime future. Let's give a big hand for Rui. Good evening, Web Summit. At Stratio, we believe in a world without disruptions, without lost connections, a world where vehicles never break down. From a car blocking a road to a truck with medicine or food that may never reach its destination, we have all been affected by travel disruptions. Reliability is critical. To improve reliability, vehicle manufacturers do extensive testing in extreme conditions, from freezing mountains to burning deserts. However, many problems are only found when vehicles are already operating on the road, when it is already too late. Despite large investment and innovation, with today's data analysis technology, vehicle manufacturers will require infinite capital and an endless number of engineers to achieve zero breakdowns, zero disruptions. At Stratio, we have a solution. By fusing automotive expertise with machine learning, our research has allowed us to build an automated fault and anomaly detection system. It is a fully integrated end-to-end -end solution with models that can detect a failure before it happens. Today, your vehicles cannot predict failures. We believe that in five to 10 years, all vehicles will have this technology. Without realizing it, you have already seen our technology on the road. We work with some of the largest vehicle manufacturers in the world. Automotive technologies take time to mature at scale. We have seen firsthand the challenges vehicle manufacturers teams face. Without the acceleration of automated testing, electric vehicles will take longer to come to market. The same applies to the future of autonomy. Without this technology, driverless vehicles will fail. Stratio is ready to bring to you a future that is autonomous, electric, and reliable. No surprises, no disruptions, zero downtime. I am Rui Sal from Stratio, and have a great Web Summit. All right, next we have Tonic App, who helps medical doctors diagnose and treat their patients by curating for them in a single mobile platform the best professional resources from peers, publishers, regulatory bodies, recruiters, providers, and the industry. Speaking today is founder and CEO, Daniela Sejas. Please welcome Tonic App. I know we have lots of entrepreneurs, tech people, venture capitalists in the room. Let me tell you what Tonic App is. Tonic App is healthcare. Tonic App is mobile. Tonic App is B2C. Tonic App is B2B. Tonic App is data. I know, it sounds insane, but we are pulling it. In a world where digital content and tools are dispersed throughout the web, we are aggregating the best professional resources to help medical doctors diagnose and treat their patients 
in a single mobile platform. Tonic App is where medical doctors can find everything and everyone they need. Is where all other healthcare players can actually find medical doctors digitally. So meet Tonic App. Tonic App has specialized search engines for guidelines, codes of reimbursement, medical congresses. It also has clinical algorithms, diagnostic uh, and treatment decision trees, news, jobs, and more. Tonic App is even a C-marked medical device. We have had month-on-month -month retention rates above 50% over the past six months. We've acquired 30% of all medical doctors in Portugal, more than half of all family doctors and we've closed October, growing at 88% in Spain. Data. We've collected more than 97,000 data points in 2019 alone. We've just doubled actions per user. We know our healthcare data, our real-world medical data, is going to change healthcare. And we understand that when, that when medical content and tools are already of great quality, we need not to reinvent them. That's why we partner with the largest healthcare companies in the world. And meet Tonic App team. We were just eight before summer. We are already 12 and we are growing very fast. I know that they are among you tonight. Tonic App, making healthcare simpler and happier. Thank you. That was amazing, Daniela. So our next speaker is Louise Lindblad, the co-founder of Valley Space. Valley Space is a browser-based software that enables engineers to collaboratively develop satellites, rockets, and other complex hardware. So let's welcome Louise from Valley Space to tell us more. Thank you. Let me start by showing you how messy the process of building a rocket actually is and how we at Valley Space are changing that. We need to find out what the final velocity would be if we change the fumix ratio to 4.5. change the fuel mix ratio to 4.5. The final velocity would be 14.3 kilometers per second. So this was a short glimpse into the future of engineering. But the reality is, it's 2019, so why is it still so difficult to manage complex engineering projects? When I was a satellite engineer, I thought we would be working with all the modern futuristic tools, but the reality looked a bit more like this. In fact, engineers spend 86% of their time doing non-engineering work. And at Valley Space, we want to change that. I'm sure you recognize these two rocket boosters from SpaceX, which landed in February last year. Such a complex engineering task is only possible to achieve if all the engineering data is digitized, connected, and all accessible in one single place. Our web-based platform is doing exactly that, and cutting-edge companies from all over the world are already using it to build rockets, satellites, uh, moon landers, and fusion reactors. 
they are digitizing their entire engineering tool chain and saving more than 30% of their time, which for a satellite project can be years. At Valley Spice, we want to empower the engineers of today to build amazing things. And we want to empower the engineers of the future to build things that we only can imagine today. Thank you. Banjo Robinson is a magical pen pal, a globe-trobbing cat who sends real, personalized letters and creative activities to children. Twice a month, from exciting destinations like the Taj Mahal and the Great Wall of China. A new-to-market subscription which turns reading, writing, and learning about the world into a magical game for five to eight-year-olds. Let's hear from Banjo Robinson CEO, Kate Boyle. Hi. So when I was growing up, my dad would write letters and leave them around the house for me to find. And I loved them. So much so that as an adult, I started sending letters to my friend's children. I wrote them from a globe-trotting cat and I signed them with a paw print. And children, even reluctant readers and writers, started writing back to the cat. Why? Well, Children are wired for connection, and they love magic and make-believe. And I realized there was an opportunity here to transform the way that we teach children to read and write, to turn it into a magical game. And that's just what we're doing at Banjo Robinson. So Banjo is a magical globetrotting cat, and he sends proper paper posts, real personalized letters to children from exciting places around the world like the Taj Mahal and the Great Wall of China. The letters arrive twice a month, and when they receive one, children write back to Banjo, and they leave their reply underneath the sofa for overnight collection um, by Banjo and his friends. And then it's a bit like the Tooth Fairy. In the morning, the letters will be gone, um, but Banjo can respond at scale to the questions they've been asked. We've taken the... We've taken the uh, joy of writing to Father Christmas, and we've combined it with a uh, subscription business, which allows us to publish personalized children's literature twice a month, every month. We're working with best-selling children's authors, but we're not printing books. We're zero inventory, just in time fulfillment with a positive cash conversion cycle. We're at the nexus of three fast growth markets, and our advisors are world leaders in personalized print, entertainment, ed tech, and children's IP. And children love Banjo. In our product trial with Mumsnet, 90% of them wrote back to Banjo. These are children aged five to eight, and parents are just as excited. It was the highest uh, level of parental engagement that Mumsnet have seen in a product test. We're impacting the home learning environment and classrooms alike, and abroad, in Asia, Europe and South America, Banjo's letters are just beginning to teach children English. But Banjo isn't just a character that children see on TV. He's their actual friend. They really like him. So we're not just a subscription business. We're building a global brand, a universe of Banjo Robinson and friends with super exciting products and development for older children, digital content, tea, TV, toys, and educational merchandise. We're huge fans of Sesame Street and its creators, Sesame Workshop. And I'm really excited to announce uh, tonight for the first time that we've just closed a seven-figure pre-seed investment with our dream investors, Collaborative and, Bun uh, and Sesame Ventures. We're on a mission to change the way that children everywhere learn to read, write, and understand their world. And we hope you'll join us. Thank you. That was great, Kate. So before we bring out the next company, uh, we want you to be aware that for the main event, due to broadcast constraints, we're going to ask you that as soon as we start, you all remain in your seats for the duration of the show. It's going to last for just over an hour. 
If you feel you need to leave before that time, uh, I want you to know that we have many people, in fact, 10,000 people waiting outside trying to get into the venue. So you'll have to give up your space to someone else. Let's move on with our pitches. Right next is Kat Forrest, a former Great Britain athlete who is the co-founder of East Nine, the audio-led coaching platform that's giving purpose to people's exercise and enabling them to create a genuine habit out of working out. Please put your hands together for Kat. Okay, so you've all been listening to a lot of speeches all night, so I'm just gonna start with a very quick piece of audience participation. Just put your hand in the air if you would like to do more exercise. Okay, good. So, unsurprisingly, 78% of people would like to do more exercise, but only 39% actually do. Levels of insufficient inactivity are also highest in high-income countries. One of the things that we're really finding is that fitness apps on the market currently are doing very little to genuinely address this issue of inactivity, and that is where we're different. At East Nine, we try and connect our community to our coaches. We have a clubhouse rather than an office, and we really believe that bringing our audio coaching to life by regularly meeting up with our audience so that they can understand what we're trying to do and we can understand what habits they need to form is the best way for us to make a difference. We have amazing coaches that I've personally handpicked not just for their fitness expertise, which is second to none, but also for their own journey in sport and in exercise. So whether that's training the military, whether it's chasing team selection for the Tokyo Olympics, or helping people back on a journey from life-threatening illness, our coaches really get what is required in order to achieve optimal health. They know how to deliver it through audio, which, believe me, isn't that easy, and they also know how to make it simple. And simplicity is the other piece we try and pull through into our product. Download the app, find your session, click start. That's it. We've also recently removed the need for you to take your phone with you if you're going out for a run by being one of the first fitness apps on the market to release an Apple Watch app. But this is all just the start. We're really proud that so far we've got over 15,000 members joining our community and training with us regularly. We've got incredible investors such as uh, angels like Sophia Benz and Nicholas Zenstrom and our BC's Local Globe and Cherry. The gym industry is a $100 billion global industry, and we're on a path to making a better, more accessible, less intimidating solution that drives real results and puts the member first. So if there's one thing that I ask you to do before you leave Web Summit, it's download East 9 and join Vince on his daily leg stretch. Thank you. Well, we've been at it for so long, me and Sunil, I'm kind of tired. So it's going to be great to hear about the next startup, which is called Schleep. Schleep improves the performance of companies by improving the sleep of leaders and their teams through a digital sleep coaching platform. Schleep supports clients in creating a cultural change around the topic of sleep and performance through the platform. Right, speaking to today on center stage is co-founder Jorn Albers. Come on out. Let's start with a little experiment. Please raise your hand if you needed an alarm this morning. Yeah, I see it. There are many hands up, and that's the problem. Actually, we believe that we are getting something fundamentally wrong in this world. We are not sleeping enough. And that's why we have built a company with a simple mission, helping the world sleep better. Today, I want to tell you why eight hours of sleep will impact everything. Some of you might say now, eight hours of sleep? Impossible. 
Yaron, I need... Yaron, I have too much work on my plate. I need some time with my loved ones and I also need time for myself. And you're right about that. I hear you. I used to work very long hours when I was a consultant myself. But we are also all getting it wrong. Because every minute of sleep loss directly impacts how much we get done, the quality of our work, and how much we make out of our personal lives. To illustrate this, let's assume you need eight hours of sleep, but you're getting only six. Research shows that after only four days, you will perform like someone who just drank four beers. So you are basically drunk. And the nasty thing is, you will not realize it because a sleep-deprived mind loses self-insight. We should all learn from leaders like Satya and Jeff, who do make sleep a priority. And it's not that they can sleep more because they are in this position. No research shows that they are in this position because they have always made sleep a priority. So you can literally, literally sleep your way to the top. There's a sleep deprivation epidemic out there. It costs companies three to 5,000 US dollars per employee every single year. And at Sleep, we believe that the true number is actually four times higher than that. So we are here to change this. Our team of neuroscientists and sleep psychologists bring the latest sleep research to employees all over the world with our digital sleep coaching platform. And we've shown to reduce sleep loss by up to 40% within only eight weeks. And we're here for more. Working with sleep will make you become a better version of yourself. And your organization will benefit from more inspiring leaders, workdays full of energy, and better relationships among your colleagues. Look, we know it's not easy to change, and even harder to change work cultures. And that's why we're here to help. So please reach out to hello at sleep.com so that you won't need that alarm clock anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Joran. Okay, next up is Localize, an all-in-one software solution that fully supports companies and their international employees' relocation processes. Localize's goal is to build bridges instead of walls through simplifying international mobility. So please welcome to center stage Localize founder Hannah Marie Asmussen. Hi everyone, my name is Hannah, I'm the CEO of Localize and we do international employee relocation as a service. This is an extremely relevant topic because in this very moment, 164 million people live and work outside of their home country. Labor markets are increasingly global, fired by war for talent, and the actual number of people relocating every year for work is growing at 20%. This is a great trend, but every person that ever relocated knows the problems. It starts with waiting a long time for appointments, dealing with tons of paperwork, and trying to navigate in a new city. So it's complicated. People need help. But currently, solutions are not good. Relocation services are extremely expensive. People pay on average $20,000 per relocation. Both companies and employees have to invest a lot of time, and yet the support is limited. And this is actually a big risk. We had clients of ours that lost candidates within two weeks if they did not provide adequate relocation support. We changed that. With Localize, we developed a software that cuts um, all the uh, processes within relocation by 80%. We automate everything from immigration to social integration. And the best, we aggregate all stakeholders within one software to provide a one-stop shop for relocation, to make relocation really easy, affordable, and accessible to everyone. We prove that our model works. We already relocated people from 47 countries. We launched only 12 months ago, and we're active in three markets, Germany, US, and Canada. 
and Spain being the fourth market from next week on. We're growing at 45% on average every month. These are the numbers, but what actually matters is the people we relocate. Because we believe that migration is a great thing. Our team is international. We represent four nationalities. We speak 12 languages. And we believe that the world nowadays needs someone who's building bridges instead of walls. Thank you. All right, our final breakout company is called ON, the community first brand reshaping the way women experience their menstrual cycles. Since launching in 2018, ON has dismantled the boundary between period care and self care with a range of organic products, including the UK's first pro period CBD oil and multi platform content. ON provides women with the tools, data, and support they need to manage their entire cycles. Please welcome to the stage co-founders Leah and Nikki. Every single person in this room is a result of a uterus that at some point bled. Meet Jess. We've got no slides. <laughs> Slides, anyone? She would be here, doing something <laughs> over the top. <laughs> okay, should we just go? Yes. Okay, meet Jess. She's doing some emotions up here. Her cramps hit hard and she's bloody exhausted. Before she knows it, she's bleeding, craving carbs and sugar. Five days later, her period finally stops. Next up, she's feisty and her skin is glowing, but she's burning way more energy than her body knows what to do with. Suddenly, she's drained and bloated, to the extent that she's grown a dress size literally overnight. Mood swings hit hard, and within days, her skin has turned to shit. She looks like a teenager on a fast food diet. And again, her period is about to start. This isn't a one-off, but happens on repeat 12 times a year for 45 years. That's 540 cycles. The industry and every single one of our competitors caters to this 28-day cycle by providing women with the products for the five days they bleed, and that's it. And these products, they're wrapped like sweets, filled with toxins, and take longer to biodegrade than the lifetime of the person that used them. With the global market for personal care and beauty estimated at one trillion US dollars, what about the rest of a woman's cycle? Enter ON. ON exists to reshape the way that women experience their entire cycle. We started by providing organic period products on a custom subscription. Then came CBD, the world's first pro-period CBD oil and a hormone-balancing ingestible CBD supplement. Next up, products for the full 28-day cycle. We're building a community-focused platform with a serious, no-bullshit approach to periods and cycle management. ON is going to be the global go-to destination for the products and hyper-personalized support that women deserve for their entire cycle. And on top of this, we're building the first community centered around cycles. Before we launched, a male friend bet us that we would never be able to create a community around periods. He lost his money. Even in these early stages, we see over one third of our customers post pictures of their tampons online. And our next six months of customer events, they are sold out. We've just completed the Techstars Accelerator program and been prepping to launch in retail next week. All the while, we've been increasing our B2B partners, stocking on in bathrooms across the globe. But most importantly, we've seen growth that has smashed our B2C targets. Events, referrals, ambassadors, and a shitload of press has meant that over 75% of our B2C subscriptions were acquired offline. So. For the two days of crazy that I personally attend every month. For my hormonal acne that decides to show up every four weeks. For your friend who's lost control of her cycle. For your daughter who has just started her period. For you. On. Forget that time of the month. We're here for women every time of the month. Thank you. No, no slides, that was incredible. Um, okay, so I've been given an incredible opportunity in Toronto. 
Not only do I have the privilege of running Techstars Toronto, Techstars being the worldwide network that helps entrepreneurs succeed, now recruiting startups for our third class. Applications are open, so please message me on the incredible Web Summit app. But I'm also the co-host of the most remarkable tech event called Collision. This June, Toronto's rapidly expanding tech scene will come to life once again with the arrival of tens of thousands of entrepreneurs, investors, corporate innovators, and some of the world's best celebrity speakers and, and, and investors. We want you there as well. Now, Canada is an incredibly diverse and welcoming country. In fact, we care less about where you come from and more about where you're going. So for some fun, we've placed a golden ticket, which is airfare, accommodation, and collision passes for two people from anywhere in the world to Toronto. And it's placed underneath one of your seats. So if you could just reach down and check if there's a ticket uh, taped to the base of your seat, my co-host colleague Casey Lau is outside in the audience right now having a look to see if you're the lucky winner. Got the ticket. Who's found it? Who's got it? Over there? Over there? Up there? Where? Oh, here? Oh, my God. Okay. Come on out here. What's your name? Francisca. Where are you from? Viso, Portugal. Portugal. Great. Okay. Before we give you these tickets, which are two airfare, two hotel, and two tickets to collision, you have to answer a couple questions about uh, Canada. Are you ready? First question, what is the name of the super handsome prime minister that just won his second term? Justin. Okay. What, the, what? That is his name. Trudeau. What, say it again. Justin Trudeau. Yeah, that's right. All right. All right. All right. Second question. What is the name of the basketball team that are now the NBA champions from Toronto? Raptors. Yes. What? Raptors. That's right. Yes. All right. And the last question. This is the toughest one. What are the first two words in the Canadian national anthem, O Canada? <laughs> o Canada. Oh, my God. Look who's going to collision. Round of applause. Great. Okay. Back to you, Sunil. Oh, that's amazing. Welcome to Toronto. Okay, so as mentioned before, in just a few uh, moments, we're going to be back for the main event. Please remain in your seats due to those broadcast regulations. We have to have you in here. There are a lot of people outside waiting to, to come into the building. Also, Night Summit is going to take place tonight outside this building on the waterfront. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you, Lisbon. We'll be continuing in just a few minutes.
welcome to the stage co-founder and CEO of Web Summit, Paddy Cosgrave. Holy cow! How is everybody? You're very, very welcome to Web Summit. I'm going to kick things off with a little tradition at Web Summit. The first thing I'd like to do is ask everybody to stand up, absolutely everybody to stand up. Web Summit is absolutely about our incredible speakers, but it's also absolutely about you, and it's about you meeting each other. So I'd like all of you to turn to each other, introduce yourself to two people beside you, and only then will we kick off. Okay, there's going to be lots more time for that this evening at Night Summit. Let's all get back down in our seats. Isn't that fun? So before we go to our first speaker, I just have a few things to share with you. Firstly, I would like to say a huge thank you to Portugal's police force who have worked with us over the last three years and this year and they're absolutely fantastic. About two hours ago they made a decision to start checking and holding backpacks and we fully respect their decision and we think their interests are the interests of all of you and your safety and I'd just like to thank them for their tireless efforts outside. I would also like to thank, we had 17 startups located somewhere. Could, you all, could all you guys stand up? For many of these startups, it was their very first time pitching in front of a room of 50, never mind 500 or 5,000 or 10,000 or 15,000 people. And I think they all deserve a huge round of applause. They were fantastic. The final thing, and this is a little bit fun because we get to make a little bit of noise. Over the next three days and nights, you're going to meet people from literally all over the world. And I love to ask those, you're going to pick a few countries, and I just want, I want those countries, anybody that's here from those countries, to make a little bit of noise. Last year, one country in particular blew me away. Is anybody here from the Ukraine? Is anybody here from the still United Kingdom? I love you, my brothers. Um, possibly not the noisiest country, but very polite and always here on time. Are there any Germans here? It's not the largest group, but this is definitely the loudest group. Brazilians? And then finally, for the next week, we're all Portuguese, so let's give a huge cheer for our hosts. And now it's time to go to our first speaker. I should remind you that this evening, for the first time, we're broadcasting with 12 partners, um, and there's just some restrictions. We've got 60 minutes of show time in total, so we'd love to just ask you to remain in your seats over the next 60 minutes and then come with us to Night Summit on the water just behind the Altis. For many, Edward Snowden defines what it means to be a whistleblower. In 2013, 
He exposed a system of mass global surveillance. Six years later, he continues to be one of the most listened to voices in the world. In conversation with Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist James Ball, please welcome Edward Snowden. Laura, at this stage I can offer nothing more than my word. I am a senior government employee in the intelligence community. I hope you understand that contacting you is extremely high risk. For now, know that every border you cross, every purchase you make, every call you dial, every cell phone tower you pass, friend you keep, site you visit, and the subject line you type is in the hands of a system whose reach is unlimited, but whose safeguards are not. In the end, if you publish the source material, I will likely be immediately implicated. I ask only that you ensure this information makes it home to the American public. Thank you, and be careful. Citizen Four. Sorry, I don't know anything about you. Okay, um, I work for... Uh... Sorry, I don't know who you're named. Oh, sorry. I, uh, my name is Edward Snowden. Uh, I go by Ed. Um, Edward Joseph Snowden's the full name. Edward Snowden, are you listening? I can hear you. Can you hear me? So, <laughs> so welcome to Web Summit, Edward. So, um, let's jump right in. Let's have you take us all here to the moment where you decided as a serving intelligence contractor that you needed to speak to the public, you needed to speak to the world. What, what was it like in that moment? What drove you to it? It's a good question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I hear feedback on my uh, audio line. Um, I'll just try to talk through it. Uh, imagine that you worked at the CIA. Um, you followed the rules your, your whole life. I had never been drunk. I had never smoked a joint, right? I was, I was a square. Uh, my family worked for the government. I was going to work for the government. Uh, so you come from a certain kind of background. You're a certain kind of guy. You're, you're not that exciting, um, but you believe in, in the importance of rules. And on the first day you work at the CIA, um, you have to take what they call an oath of service. Uh, it's a very solemn vow uh, in a dark room, flags all over the place with everybody else that's uh, entering government service at the same day. Uh, and here you have to swear uh, an oath to support and defend not the agency, not a secret, uh, not even a president, but the constitution of your country uh, against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Now, fast forward uh, many, many years uh, after you've signed something else, uh, what's called Standard Form 312, uh, a classified non-disclosure agreement. It means you won't talk to reporters. Um, and many years later, you find that uh, what you are doing, what everyone at your agency is doing, is a gigantic conspiracy to violate precisely that oath you took on the very first day. And this is what I struggled with for many years and eventually drove me forward is what do you do when you have contradicting obligations to what do we owe our greater loyalty to the founding documents of our society to the Constitution or to standard form 312 uh, for myself the the answer was clear um, and when the government can act behind closed doors when they can change the game without our knowledge and consent uh, I believe the public has a right to know about that now, when you made that decision to pick your, the first loyalty to the U.S. Constitution, to the world's public, what was, you know, you handed over lots of documents to reporters and they spent months and years reporting. Now, you know no one's going to remember every story, every line. <laughs> what was the message that you wanted the U.S. public, the publics of the world, to take from what you saw and you disclosed? Now, there's, there's two large ones. Um, one is uh, technological and one is democratic. 
Um, when we talk about technology, uh, the primary distinction, the thing that drove me forward, the thing that chilled me, is that intelligence collection and surveillance more broadly was happening in an entirely different way. Uh, it was no longer the targeted surveillance of the past, uh, where the police or spies went, we have this person that we suspect is up to no good, uh, and so we're going to sneak into their, their home or their office, we're going to plant a bug, we're going to go to the phone company, and we're going to tap their specific line. We're going to listen to a link uh, that they talk to bad guys with. Instead, they begin watching everyone, everywhere, all the time, saving as much information as they could, even for people who had done nothing wrong, even for people who were not suspected of doing something wrong, simply because it could eventually be useful, or maybe they wouldn't get a chance to catch it later, so they would prospectively uh, begin surveilling people before uh, they had broken the law. This is what I call um, the creation of the new permanent record. Uh, systems were being created uh, that did this all the time in the background, and nobody in a position of power tried to stop it because it benefited them. And this is what brings us to uh, the democratic problem. The law didn't matter. The courts didn't matter. Your rights didn't matter um, because the system had redefined and, and compromised them and what they meant in absolute secrecy. And this leaves us with the question that I think we are still uh, dealing with today. What do you do when the most powerful institutions in society have become the least accountable to society? And I think that's the question that our generation exists to answer. 2013 was a long time ago. Six years and the world has moved quite a long way. It's not just the U.S. president that has changed, though maybe people will feel different about the surveillance powers that has. We have seen our attitudes to tech change. We've seen the giants change. You know, we have seen far more activity from Russia, from China, from other countries. Do you think the huge debate, the huge conversation that you started, how do you feel about the state of that six years on? Have we moved forwards or... Are we moving back? <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's it's a good question. Um, and this is the really the, the subject of uh, the memoir that I just wrote, that the day I published it, uh, the CIA and NSA sued um, to try to keep people from reading uh, because they don't like books like this being written. Um, I feel looking six years on, uh, that the world is changing and we are at a point of primary vulnerability. Um, but I think as much as we see the anger rising, as much as I think we see awareness of problems uh, beginning to uh, develop, people are quite frequently mad at the right people uh, for the wrong reasons as they see this increasing predation uh, on all of us publicly uh, through these systems, whether we're talking governmental or corporate. Uh, yes, uh, these people are engaged in abuse, um, particularly when you look at a Google, an Amazon, a Facebook. But their business model is abuse. Uh, and yet every bit of it, uh, they argue, uh, is legal. And whether we're talking about Facebook or the NSA, that is the problem. That's the real problem. Uh, we have legalized the abuse of the person uh, through the personal, we have entrenched a system uh, that makes the population vulnerable for the benefit of the privileged. Now, you talk about how this collection is intrinsic to the business model of a lot of the companies we think about when we think about the internet. One of the main programs that, you know, maybe the most famous that was undercover, I've, uncovered thanks to what you revealed was PRISM, um, famously involving a lot of the biggest tech companies. Now, about three hours before that program was revealed, I was on the phone to one of the execs at one of these companies saying, what's PRISM? Why are you involved in it? And they were very confident in denying it. They didn't think <laughs> they were part of it. This was not some, no one is that good at lying. Not in tech anyway. Uh, they thought they weren't. How naive do you think tech has been about how its business model helps surveillance 
and about how it relates itself to governments around the world? I think what we saw for each of those companies in their own ways, I don't think it was a collaborated uh, decision uh, across the industry, um, was an entrance into a Faustian bargain. Um, they, they had made the deal with the devil, as it were, um, where they went in this way, in this particular circumstance, and we are going to construct a, a data sharing method uh, for us to go beyond what the law requires. Uh, to do this government a favor, uh, because we believe this government is a positive force for the world. And I think we can all understand uh, and appreciate uh, where that initial drive comes from. You want to believe that government is going to have the tools they need to investigate serious crimes, uh, to prevent acts of terrorism. But when we look at what these programs actually were used for um, and, and what the results of them were uh, over many, many years, uh, we saw that tools that had been intended uh, to protect the public uh, had been in many ways used to attack uh, the public. But the government's not going to tell um, these companies why, in many cases, they need this information. They're simply going to try to create those methods of exchange, those um, systems of uh, information sharing, as they call it. And ultimately, what they're doing is they're deputizing um, these companies to act in what are increasingly quasi-governmental roles, uh, deciding what can and cannot be said on the internet, uh, deciding what can and cannot be shared, um, and ultimately uh, turning over perfect records of private lives on demand uh, to institutions that are no longer meaningfully accountable uh, to the public at large. So we're in the middle of something of a backlash towards a lot of big tech. And it's a strange backlash. Sometimes it's because tech is seen as violating privacy or acting badly. And sometimes it comes from governments for tech protecting privacy, encrypting things and, you know, quotes, helping terrorists. Do you think this backlash towards tech, which for a while at least, was seen as this force for good, this different uh, thing from big corporations. Is that helping the surveillance era, or is it harming it? <laughs> uh, it's a good question. It's a complicated one. I think the answer is um, both. Uh, technology is, is largely value neutral. Um, it is an amplification of individual power. But what is an institution than the accumulation of individual power are put toward a single purpose? Um, when we have new technologies uh, that are being used uh, by small companies, by non-governmental organizations, by um, human rights defenders and activists, uh, to try to empower the public broadly and, and protect them from threats and vulnerabilities, we start moving in the direction of a... Uh, safer and freer world. Uh, when we see governments and corporations working in concert, um, we begin to see um, the birth of a complex between the two, where, where neither truly acts independently uh, or adversarially, but rather uh, they become the left and the right hand of the same body. Uh, what we see is the concentration of power now, when we have an institution uh, in, or institutions which were already powerful before, um, and now they are combining their powers uh, to control uh, or at least influence uh, what everybody who is outside of those institutions are able to do, um, that I think raises real questions of is the ultimate benefit worth the cost, because if you create an irresistible power, uh, whether it's held by Facebook or whether it's held by uh, any government, um, the question is, how will you police the expression of that power when it is used against the public rather than for it? If this is essentially the bad version of the internet, the dangerous version of the internet, what does a good version of the internet look like? What helps you build that? You know, we are speaking to you from within the EU. 
So is it something like GDPR? Do we have a panacea <laughs> there? This is a, uh, a, a good bit of uh, legislation in terms of the effort that they're trying to do. Uh, is GDPR the correct solution? Um, I, I think no, and I think the mistake that it makes is actually in the name. Uh, the gen general data protection regulation uh, misplaces the problem. The problem isn't data protection. The problem is data collection. Um, regulating the protection of data presumes that the collection of data in the first place was proper, that, that it was appropriate, that it doesn't uh, represent a threat or a danger, that it's okay to spy on everybody all the time, whether they're your customers or whether they're your citizens, so long as it never leaks, so long as only you are in control of what it is that you've uh, sort of stolen from everybody. Um, and I would say not only is that incorrect, uh, but if we learned anything uh, from 2013, it's that eventually everything leaks. It's a bad strategy. So, but to just test you on that a little bit, one of the rare things with GDPR is it's got big fines. You know, you can have 4% of your money are there not some tech giants you'd like to see facing that kind of thing? Uh, absolutely. Like, this is the thing where I say it is uh, a good first effort, right? It is low bar, um, and they have raised that bar, uh, and that is meaningful. What I'm saying is that it's not a solution. What I'm saying is that it's not the good Internet that we want, because even though the GDPR does propose, I believe, 4% uh, of global revenue fines for Internet giants, um, Today, those fines don't exist. Uh, and until we see those fines uh, being applied every single year uh, to the Internet giants until they reform their behavior uh, and begin complying not just with the letter but the spirit of the law, uh, it is a paper tiger. Um, and I think that actually gives us a false sense of reassurance uh, because these companies that are the ones who that fine is most threatening to uh, are also the ones with the most lawyers uh, who are able to undermine uh, the meaning of that law the most effectively. Now, of course, the room that you're speaking to here, this is a room full of tech entrepreneurs, of tech executives, of tech investors, maybe one or two regulators, but that's not the main crowd. What do you <laughs> sure. want them to build next? What do you want them to do next? What, what is the sort of positive thing that you could see from them for the next era of the internet? I think we need to consider uh, what the real problem is. Uh, what is responsible for this mood that we all feel, whether we're talking politics, whether we're talking technology, whether we're talking economy. Um, the public, uh, my generation, particularly the generation after me, um, they no longer own anything. Um, they are increasingly not allowed uh, to own anything. Um, you use these services and they create uh, a permanent record of everything you've done simply by having your phone uh, in this room on you in your pocket, not even using it, but simply having it turned on, uh, registers your presence at this event uh, because your phone's association with the Wi-Fi points that are around it, your phone's association with the cellular towers uh, that are around it. Um, and this is the thing that, that people miss. Uh, all of these companies, all of these governments go, oh, data collection, data protection. I mean, it's all very abstract. But uh, data isn't harmless. Data isn't abstract when it's about people. And almost all of the data that's being collected today is about people. Uh, it is not data that is being exploited. It is people that are being exploited. It is not data and networks that are being influenced and manipulated. It is you that is being manipulated. Uh, and right now, uh, the reason that is so, uh, and the reason surveillance and collection is so much of a problem, is because we have to trust everybody on the network, we have to trust everyone that we pass on this hostile path of the internet. All of the routers, all of the internet service providers that you cross. Um, if you have to trust Cisco or Juniper or Huawei or Nokia, uh, we have a problem because you can't trust any of them. They will all act in their own interest 
uh, rather than the public's interest broadly. Uh, whether it's a private company or a national telecommunications company, uh, it is an institution of power. Um, and our communications are vulnerable today to every single one of them until we change the model, until we redesign the basic system of connectivity in the internet. Uh, we have more and more communications becoming encrypted today uh, or electronically protected, right? They're no longer electronically naked as they cross this hostile path. But it is not all of them. Even when they are uh, being encrypted, they are still uh, uh, observed. You can Edward, see the origin I'm, in the I'm going section. to have to cut you there with that challenge for building a new internet. So Edward Snowden, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. I'm going to say one last thing if I can. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I know we're out of time, but one last thing. Um, and this is for the call for restructuring the internet. It's much more simple than that. Um, rather than asking people to trust you, rather than asking them to trust your service, as all of your ailing competitors do, show them why they don't have to trust you. Um, have all of the intermediaries uh, between you and the people that you're talking to are not in control of you. They do not understand your content. It is private to them. The only people you have to trust are the people that you're talking to, the people on the ends of the communication. And the reason that is important, even if you are for the NSA, even if you are for Facebook, uh, is that there are companies, there are laws that do not apply to these countries. There are different jurisdictions and the internet is global. The law is not the only thing that can protect you. Uh, technology is not the only thing that can protect you. Uh, we are the only thing that can protect us. And the only way to protect anyone is to protect everyone. Thank you and stay free. Thank you very much. Wasn't that fantastic? Um, yesterday, for the very first time, we launched a swag store. If you want to get a t-shirt or a number of other little gifts, uh, just go to swag.websummit.com. So incredible engineers and entrepreneurs from around the world are coming to work in Portugal. Meanwhile, incredible Portuguese entrepreneurs are building companies all over the world. All of you have traveled from across the world to be in Portugal for the next week. And so we've invited two extraordinary entrepreneurs to tell you a little bit more about Portugal. Please welcome, in conversation with Filomena Cautela of RTP, Michelle Zatlin, founder of Cloudflare, which recently went public on the New York Stock Exchange, and Portugal's very own Daniela Braga, founder of Define Crowd. Danielle and Michelle, you have to you have to allow me this. Make some noise, Web Summit! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Done. Check. Thank you. <laughs> it was a dream come true. Is that from Eurovision? Yes, of course. Okay, perfect. <laughs> it's it's a reminiscence. It's coming all it's all coming back to me. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna open with a question. Um, just to explain a little bit who, who am I with? Uh, is it fair, ladies, Michelle and Daniela? Is it fair to say? 
that I'm talking with possibly the two first women to become self-made billionaires in their own countries. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Was it too strong? Sorry. But we, is it, we, we is agree, it fair to say? We agree that we were not going to talk about this. Yes, yes. But is it, is it fair to say? Is it true? Uh, not billionaires yet, but probably millionaires. Right. Uh, well, Cloudflare is a public company now, so you can easily go look up my, my share in the company and, and, our, and our market cap. Um, I mean, I think for us, Cloudflare, we're working on a really big problem. We're very long-term focused. We've yes. been building Cloudflare for nine years, and I think that every day our whole team shows up every day to build an iconic company that solves real problems for our customers. And while I'm so proud of what we've accomplished, we're just getting started. And so, I mean, I think if you do the math, it's a possibility sometime in the far, far distance. And but so it is true. It's, <laughs> it, it, it is a possibility. It is right. in the art of possibility. We have very little time. So I just wanted to say, Michelle, uh, when, I was, uh, when I was reading your bio, your bio is absolutely fascinating, and I wanted to share with all of you t uh, today. Um, Michelle uh, creates products people love. I love this. She has been named one of the top women to watch in technology by the Huffington Post and Inc. Magazine. We should totally hang out, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Co-founder and COO of Cloudflare, uh, of course, was selected by the the Wall Street Journal as the most innovative internet technology company two years running and named a technology pioneer by the World Economic Forum. Today, Cloudflare accelerates and protects more than two million web properties and it's moving its engineering division from North America to Lisbon. Is it true? That's true. Yeah, no, it's we. So we're about 11. That, thank you for those very kind words. Um, uh, we have 1,100 people around the world and we have a we had a big office in London, and we started to look out in San Francisco, Austin, Texas, London, and we started to say, where else could we build an engineering hub? And we actually did a survey of 45 cities across Europe in the EMEA region. Yes, and why Lisbon? Uh, and originally, Lisbon wasn't on the top. <laughs> if I had, When we started the project, I never thought Lisbon would have been the city we selected. <laughs> but through good due diligence, it kept becoming, wow, Lisbon's really interesting. The talent is amazing here. Both. Engineers, the universities are incredible here, the local talent, all the Portuguese who have left um, to other countries around the world, the diaspora who want to come back. Yeah. Uh, the government has made some really great policies to encourage those folks internationally to come back through attractive in income tax reductions. And they've also made really um, attractive policies for non-Portuguese who want to come live in this beautiful country with sure. incredible weather. So by the end, we were basically saying, Lisbon is like the Bay Area 50 years ago. High quality of life, incredible talent, the next heart of innovation in, in Europe, and we want to bet on it. And, and so this place not a, this was a local joke. <laughs> oh. See? Nobody gets, I Very few it, Portuguese nobody people here. <laughs> uh, uh, Daniela, uh, actually, actually, you were born in Portugal. And studied, made my basic formation here. Yep. So, Daniela, for all, of us, uh, for all of you to know, is the founder and CEO of Define Crowd, one of the fastest growing startups in the AI space, has deep expertise in speech science, and is one of the world leaders of crowdsourcing uh, adoption in large enterprises. Dr. Braga, I love to call you Dr. Braga, it's so cool, <laughs> created the data science team and shipped voice enabled products for clients like Samsung, Toyota, introduced crowdsourcing for big data data solutions and restructured the engineering, engineering sorry, infrastructure around data collection, processing, ingestion, instrumentation, and discoverability. I'm pretending I know what I'm talking about, <laughs> but uh, it's, truly, it's truly amazing. So why Portugal, Daniela? This is, this is the main Well, uh, first because I am Portuguese, and if I started, I started my company in Seattle, where I live for eight years. But I knew that my product had to be built in Portugal because the tech talent is here. I know the quality of the universities. Uh, there w we were very lucky to be supported in, from the beginning by the government, by Startup Lisboa. There's an amazing ecosystem here. And um, machine learning, speech, uh, speech talent, natural, uh, natural language processing, software developer engineers, product are all here. It's completely, we're sell to Fortune 500 companies with pro a product made in Portugal. That's amazing. So is it true that your company defined, pro yes, thank you. Yes, yes, indeed, <laughs> indeed.
Uh, is it true that uh, actually your um, d diversity is really re is a real reality in your in your company? Because is it true that there's 42% women in a world that maybe in tech there's like what 5% 2%? I live, you know, I come from a, a world of engineers. I'm always the only woman in the room since I'm 22. <laughs> um, and in reality, my company is 42% of women, and we are not doing it on purpose. Yes. It's just do it. It's happening. Yes, all over the world. In our five offices already, everywhere people come to work because I I suppose that they feel that they can be whoever they are, and the sky is the limit in our company. Congratulations, Michelle. Do you live this reality as well? One of the things um, our CTO was based in in London. He's here tonight. Hi, John. And he came to meet a lot of, well, before we made our decision to come to Lisbon. Came and met a lot of tech co tech company startups here in Lisbon to see like what it's like on the ground. You know, you kind of do your your paper research, but wanted to see what it was really like um, building a company here. And one thing that he noticed when he went to visit all these these tech companies in in Lisbon was like, wow they are light years ahead in diversity. They have diverse teams, the diversity of talent. He just said it was just so noticeable compared to what he had seen both in London and in San Francisco. So I think that's a real testament to the country and the universities and, and, and to creating opportunities well, for you. everyone. So thank you very amazing. much, Miss. Uh, Michelle, I wanted to ask you as well, what's the one thing, actually this was, this was a question you gave me. Okay. Uh, what's the one thing you think everyone sitting in these chairs should know. The thing is, what do you, did, did you wish to know when you were sitting in one of these chairs? Sure, I have two. When I was sitting in your chair nine years ago, was starting my company, uh, the rate at which you learn is a founder's best asset. Nobody knows what they're doing on day one, but the faster you can learn, the better off you'll be. The best founders are like sponges, high rate of learning. And the second thing, which is very, very appropriate for, for 2019, is corporate governance is cool. So take it seriously. <laughs> Very good piece of advice. Thank you, Michelle. Daniela, do you have some advice for everyone sitting here tonight and hearing us? Pick your investors wisely. Mm. Don't, let, don't let them pick you. Um, and uh, rule by, not rule, but lead by model. Do it, what, do exactly what you expect your people to do. Don't expect them to just create without seeing it. I guess those are my two cents. <laughs> Ladies, it was truly an honor to be with you. It was truly an honor to meet you today. We had eight minutes to talk. If this wasn't web out, I would say this was a quickie, but it was. Uh, so thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And have a nice web summit. It will be amazing. Thank you so much. You. It was an thank honor. You. Thank you. Oh, yes. Where's Patty? So, two more speakers. As many of you know, Web Summit has a sister conference which we started a few years ago. It's called Collision. Collision takes place for the second time in Toronto next June. Many of you in this audience were there this year and will be there this coming June. For those who haven't been to our conference in Toronto, Collision, here's a little taster. Toronto had firmly arrived on the world's tech scene the fourth largest tech market in all of North America. There is room for everyone to succeed. We are building an ecosystem. This isn't going to happen overnight. Technology is all around us. Toronto is having a moment. We can lose sight. Technology is great, but it's about people. If we all come together as a people, the world will end right in front of us. Because if we don't succeed together, we're all going to fail separately. It's a good city. Toronto's not a bad city. Now, I'm delighted to invite the Mayor of Lisbon and Government of Portugal to the room. Let's give them a big, warm Web Summit welcome. <clears throat> Our next guest is the chairman of the world's second largest smartphone manufacturer, 
In 2018 alone, Huawei sold a record $52 billion worth of products, including 200 million smartphones. But today, they're here to talk about what is potentially the most transformative technology of the next decade. As we stand at the precipice of a 5G-driven world, we'll explore the newest route on this information superhighway. Please put your hands together for the chairman of Huawei, Guo Ping. Thank you. I'm honored to be here with you all. Today, I, I want to talk to you about why 5G represents a golden opportunity for our entire industry, and particularly you, the developers. My topic is 5G Plus X will create a smart new era. This X can be AI, big data, or VR, AR, among other technologies. As you all know, 5G deployment has just begun. AI applications for a range of industries are still in their infancy. I believe that in the future, 5G plus X will create countless opportunities for entrepreneurs. In 1875, the Paris note chain stations started using electric lights. In 1879, a power plant in San Francisco started selling electric power. These were historical changes. Later in 20th century, Electricity significantly increased the productivity in all industries. Humanity entered the electric age, just as the age began with electric lighting. 3G and 4G solved the problem of connecting people. 5G and AI represents a tipping point for ICT technology. This technology will be further applied in all industries, like electric. electricity was over a century years ago. This makes ICT a key enabler for industry de development. The rollout of 5G commercial networks is occurring more rapidly than expected. As of now, 40 carriers in over 20 countries are using 5G networks commercially. We predict by the end of this year, we will see 60 commercial 5G networks. The new experience delivered by 5G has been warmly welcomed by consumers. Just take South Korea, for example. One million users signed up for 5G during the first 69 days. When 4G was rolled out, it took 150 days to amass that many users. The average 5G user consumes three times as much data as a 4G user. 5G can achieve speeds as high as 20 gigabits per second and the latency as low as one millisecond. It can support one million connections per square kilometer. 5G can ensure superior experience for the Internet of Things. You are familiar with cloud and AI. 5G reduces the distance between devices and cloud. 
putting the computing power of the cloud right in your pocket. Now I'd like to share some case studies with you. ago at the Huawei Forum, the CEO of Swiss carrier Sunrise demonstrated these 5G use cases. In the field 20 kilometers away, three musicians played the upper homes while in a foreign venue, another musician played the guzheng, a Chinese string instrument. The ultra-high bandwidth and ultra-low latency of 5G kept the musicians in perfect time with each other. In the near future, people separated by long distance can communicate in real time over 5G networks. Users can feel as if they are sitting in the same room together. Located in Rotterdam, the Shell Paris Oil Refinery hopes to improve the safety of its works, workers and improve operation and maintenance efficiency. With 5G, patrol robots can roam the complex and quickly support oil leaks and respond. This reduces the risks of working on site. During inspection, smart 5G helmets can allow junior en engineers to talk in real time with off-site experts. The experts can view the work on site on the ultra HD video stream. This reduces the time it takes to complete an inspection from days to hours. 5G Plus makes the inspection of the 160,000 kilometers of pipes easier than ev ever before. 5G and AI are not just being used in entertainment and the factories. They are also used for medical diagnosis and treatment. Every day, 11,000 children are born with visual impairments. Many of these kids will go undiagnosed for years. This will impact their entire life trajectory, and in some cases, even their life expectancy. It doesn't have to be this way. 70 to 80 percent of visual impairments are either preventable or curable if detected early enough. The problem is we are still using assessment tools that can't diagnose everyone, including children who can't speak or those who don't have complete control of their motor functions. That's why we created Track AI. With Track AI, we're able to capture the smallest movements of the eye. Using TensorFlow, an open source machine learning platform, we're able to identify patterns in these movements. These patterns can point to potential pathologies. At Huawei, we're constantly looking for ways that our technology can be used to help others. So when we understood what the dive team were doing, we just had to help. It's incredible to see how they're using our technology to better the lives of children. With the processing power of the Huawei P30, physicians can use Track AI to make assessments in real time, even offline. And with High AI, the developers are able to leverage this processing power in the ways that works best for them. We believe that AI can push beyond what's humanly possible, and that it has the potential to enrich lives in ways that we're just now discovering. We're excited to keep evolving this technology. We're proud to enable those who use it to make the world a bit better every day.
We've just looked at some typical 5G applications. 5G plus X is changing the way we work and live. 5G is an upgrade to our communication infrastructure, and AI provides us with more powerful computing engines. However, the applications and the software built on top are what generate true value. The internet shows us that app developers typically get the lion's share of profits, and their income increases most rapidly. This is a huge market worth trillions of US dollars. The biggest winner will be our partners. For the past 30 years, Huawei has been working with carriers to create the foundation for the internet. So app and software developers can fully unleash their potential. In the 5G plus X era, we will continue to enable app developers and drive the entire industry forward. Specifically, we are focused on two areas, mobile devices and the cloud. To support these two areas, we have launched the Huawei Developer Program and the Shining Star Program. I'd like to now talk about the Huawei Developer Program. This is a program aimed at advancing ICT technology. Over the last five years, we established 21 open labs around the world and already have 1.3 million developers. Now we are starting to roll out our developer program 2.0. Over the next five years, we will invest 1.5 billion US dollars as we expand the program to 5 million developers. We have programs for universities and institutes, individuals, startups, and partners. For example, we provide free AI boats and vouchers for cloud services, chaining to enterprise developers and some European universities. We are working to make AI development easier for all developers. AI has already attracted a lot of attention, but the technology is complex. We are still facing a skill shortage. To help developers to use AI in positive ways, we have launched the model arts to make their work easier. We use AI itself to solve the problem of AI development. Model Arts supports automatic data enrichment, automatic data optimization, and one-click model training among the features. Simply put, we want developers to be free to focus on their core work. Huawei will take care of the complex computing problems. Developers can just focus on designing so service logic and creating the best possible products. So far, smartphones have had the biggest impact on our daily life. However, we will soon enter a fully connected world. For this, Huawei has long been determined to develop the next generation device ecosystem. Huawei has launched a one plus eight plus N O scenario strategy, in which smartphones connect all kinds of devices and offer all scenarios services. At home, Users can 
switch seamlessly between your smartphone and the large screens with a single touch. In the car, mobile phones apps can interface with the vehicle itself. The next generation device ecosystem will be about more than smartphones. We'd like to see developers join and innovate their apps for integrated applications. Huawei smartphones, smart watches, and smart screens are very popular. To deliver better experience, we are opening up to more third-party apps and services. This has allowed the Huawei mobile services ecosystem to develop. Huawei also provides all kinds of service kits, enabling developers to quickly develop apps and distribute them to Huawei devices in all scenarios. We have also allocated $1 billion to our Shining Star program, which aims to motivate developers to innovate. With this program, we hope to attract more high-quality apps and to join our HMS ecosystem. Tomorrow afternoon, we will provide more details at our Huawei Development Day event. We hope to see you there. Thank you. 5G Plus X is the new electricity. It will be the key enabler of the smart world. Huawei looks forward to working with industry developers and startups to create more 5G Plus X applications. We welcome you all to join us in creating the smart new era. Thank you. So, is everybody ready for our final speaker? Kind of. Oh, come on, we can cheer louder than that. Who's ready for Jaden Smith? He's flown all the way from California. We're going to give him a huge round of applause in a moment to Portugal. Please welcome, in conversation with Laurie Siegel of Dot Dot Media, founder and CEO of Blue Tech Research, Paul O'Callaghan, co-founder and CEO of Water.org, Gary White, and co-founder of Just Water, Jaden Smith. Jaden, that you feel like Beyonce when you're out here. You're right. But you're then right. I was like Jaden Smith, so I was like, I can't say that to you. Um, before we get started, I want to play a quick trailer. Let's take a look. Imagine if tomorrow we cured cancer, and in a hundred years there were still a million kids dying of cancer. It would be unthinkable. But that's the situation we find ourselves in with water. By 2025, 1.8 billion people will be living in water stress regions. We are reaching a perfect storm in terms of water. The reason you need to care about the water crisis is because it's going to directly affect you and your family. We're on the brink of being hopeless, but we're not there yet. 
we break down the barriers between people and safe water and sanitation. We envision a day when everybody has access to clean water and sanitation, and we envision that in our lifetime. People who are really struggling with drought or deteriorating water quality, those are the people on the edges and the fringes that are really innovating. We just came from a very dry season, so this was the only source of drinking water for these children. The water we have today is the water we've always had. We use it and then we throw it away. Nature doesn't do that. Everything that you need to stay alive except carbon is in your waste. It's in your feces and your urine and in the breath that comes out of you. Toilet to tank is really what we're doing here. It was always my dream. I can take my wastewater, put it in my car and drive off into the sunshine. It breaks my heart that we have the solutions and then we can't get them out fast enough. This can happen in our lifetime. This has to happen in our lifetime. Or we are looking at a very different world for our children. How lucky are we that we're the ones who get to solve this? In a hundred years, people are going to wish they were alive and they could solve a problem this big. I think it sets the stage that we're at an a massive tech event and we're talking on opening night about water. I think that says a lot. So um, this is a documentary that all of you guys have been a part of called Brave Blue World. And I get the sense that this is a bit of a call to action. Um, why is this personal to you guys and, and what brought you all together? I can start with you, Paul. Sure. Well, I'm a scientist. I'm a water scientist. And I spend my life looking at water challenges and how to solve those challenges. And Everywhere I look, I see cause for optimism. And yet, a lot of what I think most people hear about, if they hear anything about water, is apocalyptic tales of doom and gloom, that we're running out of water, and that we'll fight wars over water. And yet, there's a different story. And we have fantastic tech. We have great financial innovation that can help address this. And my motivation as a scientist to create a water documentary was communication, to spread this message to a broader audience such as the people here at the Web Summit, that there is a water crisis. It's closer than you think. The great news is we have solutions, and you're all part of that solution. That was the motivation. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Gary? Well, for me, it's personal because it's such a tragic situation that we live in. You know, the fact that uh, more than 750 million people today don't have access to water, and more than 2 billion don't have access to safe sanitation. And that is just inexcusable. You know, on a planet where we solved this problem 100 years ago, how crazy is it that people still don't have access to that? And so it's not enough just to be aware of the issue, but it's like, how do you take action? And what we know is we have to innovate. And that's what we're seeing with what uh, Jaden and Paul are doing. But what we're doing also is innovating in new ways around finance and recognizing that people living in poverty already pay a lot of money for water. And just you know, one quick story to illustrate why we approach this with micro loans for people in need of safe water is a woman I recently met, uh, Lynn Adiza, in the Philippines. She was paying $60 every month for the water for her family that she needed because she had to buy it from these water vendors, sometimes the water mafia, these trucks that sell water. And she had to do that to make her family survive. But what we were able to do with our partners is get her a small loan, about $200, so she could connect to the water utility. Once she did that, her water bill went down to $5 a month, and her loan payment was $5 a month. And so that's what we're trying to do, bring innovation into this and, and understand that the poor actually can be part of the solution as opposed to a problem to be solved. And that's really what we're doing. So you multiply Linariza by 22 million, right. and that's how many people we've helped through loans with about $2 billion in capital. So we've got to find ways to bring innovative financial solutions in this as well as the, the tech and the movement building that needs to happen. Right. And, and Jaden, how about you? I mean, you grew up in the movies. You have this incredible celebrity family. You could literally do anything. I mean, you put out uh, music and it gets downloaded like 100 million times on Spotify, like everything you do just turns to cool, I would say. And even me saying that, I sound uncool saying that, I feel like. Um, why, why water? And how on earth did you guys just end up on stage together and collaborating? 
Well, water has always been important to me ever since I was 11 years old. I started learning about the environment. I started learning about oceans, plastic, CO2, all the different gyres of plastic in the Pacific. And it really impacted me at a young age. And I really wanted to make a difference and get out there and somehow get into the conversation of water, sanitation, and sustainability. So at the age of 11, that's when I started Just Water, the company. It's 82% made out of renewable resources, and it's 72% reduction in CO2 emissions compared to any of our competitors in a similar size. And I started that at the age of 11 with Drew Fitzgerald, who's in the crowd right now, and that's how we really got into water and caring and understanding how important it is. And at the end of the day, we all are water, you know, and we came from water. So when Paul reached out to us to talk about this documentary and to work together, it was just such a no-brainer because I care about water so much. Ever since from a young age when I was learning how to surf and I saw the first like plastic ball of water that in my life that I'd seen floating in the ocean and my surfing teacher would tell me that, you know, the ocean is alive and the ocean is your friend and all these things. So I, I feel like I've almost had a spiritual connection with water from a very, very young age. Um, and Paul, I mean, we see, I've, I've watched the documentary, there's all this really interesting tech work that's happening kind of behind the scenes when it comes to water and the future and trying to solve this crisis. What's the most, I mean, you spend, this is what you do night and day. What is the most interesting uh, tech innovation you see happening when it comes to the water crisis? Well, it's hard to pick one because it's, it's no, there's no silver bullet. It requires tech for sure, and there's some amazing solutions, and in fact, whether you're in digital technology, IoT, um, biotech, advanced material science, there are applications in water to do things with that technology. Mm -hmm. Sure, we need financial innovation to bring financial capital to bear on the problem. Policy is a part of it, and really people getting it, just getting that we can solve this and we can do it. Mm -hmm. But you know, if I had to pick an example, one thing that really resonated with me was we went to Kenya filming, and we visited an orphanage where these children had had no access to water for months, essentially, because the rains were late in coming. During that time, they had a device which captured water directly from the air, because there's always some water in the atmosphere. And that innovation meant that those children didn't have to walk, you know, multiple kilometers a day to get drinking water. And by the time we were there filming, the rains had arrived, and they collected that rain in tanks, and they were so happy, they were hand-washing their clothes. And I was like, God, if I told my kids, you can hand-wash your clothes, we have some water. You know, it just it was incredible, the difference it made to their lives. Mm -hmm. That was certainly one example that struck me deeply, even as someone who's been 20 years in water, I think to see it firsthand um, really had an impact. And you say a lot of this is happening also on like a local level, like people coming up with very innovative solutions within their communities. It's hyper-local, although it's a global issue because it affects us all, it's hyper-local, which is empowering because we can make a difference in our communities. And as we went around the world, we could see examples of textile mills in, China, in India which had gone to zero liquid, recycling all of their water. Uh, in Andalusia, in Spain, someone had converted wastewater into biogas and they were driving their car based on wastewater. Mm -hmm. In um, Kenya, people building solutions based on turning feces into fuel to offset carbon emissions. So if you look globally, there's a theme. It's local. It's looking at nature for inspiration. And you, you certainly, what can apply in Flint equally well can apply in Africa. And um, Gary, you guys sent me some stats that I, I was, I mean, the stats are alarming, right? I know we talk like doom and gloom, not yeah. to be doom and gloom, but one in every nine people on the planet lack access to water. One in three people lack access to a toilet. Um, but your whole thing, and for those who don't know, you work with Matt Damon, too, mm -hmm. not to yeah. just drop Matt Damon. We're co-founders. Uh, yeah, just to give some context on, on GaryandWater.org. Um, mm -hmm. But you don't necessarily think giving or just charity is the answer. You actually have a model that you've played out that you think works better. Yeah, absolutely. I think the thing we have to recognize is charity is great, but it has its natural limitations. And there's never going to be enough charity in the world to solve this crisis. It's a trillion dollar problem that's facing us with the infrastructure needs. And so we need that top-down investment. We also have to meet it from the bottom up. And the good news is that there are literally hundreds of millions of people like Lynn Ariza who just 
just given the opportunity to get a small loan to help get a water connection to the utility or get a water filter, that's massive capital from the bottom up. I mean, as NGOs, we talk in the millions, but, you know, $2 billion in capital from the bottom up to meet this need. And these loans, uh, more than half the people live on less than $2 a day, and they repay them at 99%. And so we have to look at this as all hands on deck, the technological solutions, the top-down funding. We at Water.org need philanthropy, right? We use that philanthropy to catalyze loans. Every dollar that we deploy in philanthropy leverages $60 in loans. So how do you harness the power of the capital markets? That's the only way we're going to be able to do this. And that's what we do. We build the bridge between investors in the capital markets and provide them actually a financial return through water equity, and we connect that to the Linareses who are living on a few dollars a day, and everybody benefits, and now we can match the magnitude of the finance to the magnitude of the problem and get line of sight on everybody getting water and sanitation. It's going to be everybody pulling together to do it. It's, I mean, it seems like a no-brainer, but it's so fascinating to see how well that has worked. I mean, do you guys have any idea of what's coming next that we can expect from you guys? So what we want to do next and we're working on uh, the platform right now, in fact, with IDO uh, in San Francisco. And what we want to do is democratize this. So right now, the investors in water equity that fund these microloans are all accredited investors, people you know, investing a million dollars and more. We're building a platform that will allow people to develop an impact account. It'll sit alongside their savings account or checking account. Mm -hmm. And when they keep their money in that and it's fully liquid, we are using it behind the scenes to connect it to the Linareses who need those loans. And so you'll be able to, for the first time, create impact in the world without giving your money away, but just lending it to us for mm -hmm. a period of time. And you'll be able to track exactly how much you benefit different people with the water that they get, the toilets that are built, et cetera. So watch for that in 2020. Um, Jaden, I want to talk about, because you've, you you do just water, which seems to be doing very well. Um, is it worth 100 million? Is that? Is That's it? what uh, Fast Company um, just released an article for okay. evaluation. So unconfirmed, but Uncon okay, <laughs> yeah. fair. Um, so, but you you also you've gotten involved with water on a, a very on a broader level too. You have gone into Flint um, and yes. tried to help out there. 100%. Um, did I read you went to church to try to figure out a, a local solution to to what might be uh, interesting for Flint. So could you talk to us a little bit? 100%. So Flint, Michigan has been going through a water crisis with lead poisoning in the pipes for the past five years. And people have been aware and they've been giving donations to Flint, Michigan of, you know, 2 million bottles of water the first year, 1.5 the next year, one, and then down to 800,000 and dwindling lower and lower as we keep going. Um, and the problem with water bottles in Flint is that people are showering with this water, people are putting this water in pots to make breakfast for their kids. People are doing all things that they need to do with water on a daily basis, brushing their teeth, everything with bottles of water. And at the end of the day, in a community, if you're trying to raise children, you need to feel as though you have a clean source of water in that community and that you don't have to rely on donations from other people that have been dwindling down every year. So what me and Drew did with our entire Just Water team is we created a water filtration system that specifically takes lead out of the water to deploy in Flint, and it does 10 gallons of water every 60 seconds. So we give that opportunity for people to go and fill up bigger drums of water for free, whether you have a five-gallon drum you have a 10 gallon drum so that you can use it more efficiently than 500 milliliters and unscrew the top while you're you know giving your child a shower or you're cooking food or something we wanted to give people a uh, a larger amount of clean water in flint michigan and that's just one of the ways that we can use different technologies when it comes to filtration to solve problems around the world and you know my original idea was i wanted to deploy in africa and so many different places around the world but i wanted to do it in my backyard first to pr get a proof of concept so that then I could take it to the world. And now we have three water boxes in Flint. Right now, we're going to have six there by the end of 2020. So we're really excited. What's kind of interesting, though, is you're bringing a little bit of this lifestyle brand. I mean, you look at them. I, I think one says, like, sponsored by Apple or, like, mm -hmm. Ellen. Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to, to tell a different story besides it's just this water box, right? So you're, how are you trying to combine, like, lifestyle brands with 
you know, we're trying to make it cool. We're trying to make it something that kids can be interested in. We're also giving um, kids in Flint the opportunity to build a water box for themselves to see how it works. To you know, maybe they want to be a water engineer when they get older and start figuring out filtration systems for p people across the world. So we do try to make it cool and you know get cool sponsors that people will like. But at the end of the day, we're just trying to supply clean water for the people in Flint and hopefully for the whole world. You know, and the corporations care about this more and more. I mean, the the brand partnership we have with Stella Artois has been amazing. The you know the Super Bowl commercials that they put behind this, trying to make this issue more mainstream, and partnering with Water.org on that. They see huge value in that, both with the customers, but their employees and engaging them. They I've been told by the team there that people in in ABI want to come to work on this project with Water.org, and they're lobbying to get that position inside ABI. So it's not only you know customers, but it's like employee attraction and retention that these companies are really getting by partnering with issues like this. Yeah, c corporations are huge users of water. I mean, for every liter that we consume or drink that in our homes, there's probably 50 plus that we're using for the clothes we use, the computers, the food we eat, mm -hmm. and all of those big brands, whether it's, like we see L'Oreal, for example, is embracing that. They've decided we will not take water from our communities. If we're in Mexico, we'll be neutral. If we're in, in North Africa, we'll be water neutral. Now, that's something is to be applauded. Corporations get a bad rap when they do bad things, justifiably so, but equally well, they should be recognized and acknowledged when they are a force for positive change. Uh, and increasingly, uh, I, I see encouraging signs that, that is the case. That's great. Um, last question. What can everybody in this audience do to, to make a difference? You know, I think sometimes it feels like it's a very distant problem if you don't have to walk outside your door to go get water. Um, this is an audience full of entrepreneurs. What can everybody in this audience do to do their part? Well, one of the goals in producing a documentary was communication and that this isn't something anyone can solve on their own. Water can be a source of conflict. More often, it can be a source of cooperation where people can come together to solve it. And whether that's looking at technology and how you can take your entrepreneurial spirit and bring it to bear on a problem that big or look at this as a way for investment and returning capital, or simply to be curious to inquire as to whether the brands that you support are showing leadership in water. Those are some of the actions we can take. From our side, I would say, you know, watch for our platform to launch in 2020, but in the meantime, Water.org uses that philanthropy to create the next innovation. The next innovation. And so donating there, unleashing even more entrepreneurial spirit to solve this crisis. Great, Jaden. And I would just say people, you know, it's so important for people, especially young people, to educate themselves. It's almost time, time to set things in motion for the official opening of this year's Web Summit. Let me begin by saying thank you to our wonderful Portuguese hosts. I'd like to ask the Minister for Economy to say a few brief words. Well, good evening to you all. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to Portugal. 
and I am humbled by the sight and the sheer size of this venue. And I think back 10 years ago, 2009 in Dublin, when a few hundred of entrepreneurs met some investors and made some uh, business, which eventually would uh, make a, uh, the, the rise of some very exciting companies. 10 years on, the site is very different. And it, uh, the pace of change in Web Summit mirrors the pace of change in digital society and the transformation that took place. Things were very, very fast. But if we look 10 years forward, the only thing we can be certain is that the pace of change will become even faster. Technology will change, as we have just seen, and will help solve many of today's and the humanity's problems. And it will create some few problems on its own. So as new things happen, we will have to address uh, matters which will be of interest to whole communities, to the whole mankind. Interests will clash. We will be writing the rules of the road, even as we are building the road and we are driving through it. Those conversations between governments, businesses, investors, stakeholders, citizens, NGOs, will have to take place. And the Web Summit in the 10 years coming will be the place where these conversations will arise. And it's very, very appropriate that these conversations will take place in Lisbon for the next 10 years. In the 16th century, Lisbon was the capital of the first globalization. We had traders, scientists, navigators from all over the world coming to this place, exchanging ideas and building value for the whole mankind, unlocking the treasures of the whole world, which was then unknown. For five centuries, Lisbon has been open to the world and has been the place where communities, cultures, different people would meet. So for the next 10 years, this partnership between Web Summit and Portugal will be the place where all these discussions about digital transformation will occur. And I promise you, Portugal will be welcoming you and others like you in the next few years with the same warmth that we have done for the past 500 years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. And now, if I could call on the mayor who's opened the doors of this wonderful city once more to say a few words. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I would like to give you all a very warm welcome to the city of Lisbon. I hope that you have the time of knowing better the city, to lose yourself on the streets, on the history, on the cultural. But I want to tell you something about Lisbon. First of all, what you are going to find is a city that is open and thriving for innovation. One of the best, best demonstrations is Web Summit. <clears throat> Paddy and I, we had some talks four years ago. And uh, when we talk about making Web Summit in Lisbon, when Paddy was deciding, one of the most important issues on deciding the location of Web Summit, he, was, he received an amazing number of messages of young Portuguese entrepreneurs, young Portuguese students, saying, please make Web Summit in Lisbon. And he did. Paddy joined us. Paddy had the confidence in Lisbon and in Portugal. And together, we've made this road in the last years of building an amazing process of innovation, of transformation. So what we are going to see in Lisbon is a city that is open to innovation, to entrepreneurs, to scientists, to the debates all around the amazing process and the amazing moment that we are living. The second is that you are going to find a city fully committed with the big challenges that we are facing in humankind. You are going to face a capital city of a country that peaked emissions some years ago. From last year to this year, we just diminished more than 10% the global emissions and we are going to continue on this path. And in next year, Lisbon is going to be European green capital of Europe, nothing to win a, a, another prize, but to create a new momentum, a new uh, process of people making projects to make our change in winning the battle against climate change. We don't need more talks 
to preach to converters. We need actions to solve the problems, and Lisbon is one of the houses of those changes. And last, you are going to find one of the most open, tolerant, available cities that you can find all around the world. Probably the most impressive reality about Lisbon is our ability to communicate with others, our cherish to receive people from different countries, different religions, different cultures, different attitudes, different backgrounds, different perspectives, different futures. That's what we are, an open city, a tolerant city, a city where everyone feels at home. And that's what I want you to make, that's what we want to find you in the next days that you find here in Lisbon. Welcome to Lisbon, welcome to Web Summit here in Lisbon. Woo! So, before I call on the Minister and Mayor to formally open Web Summit, I'd like to, to ask you to give a huge warm welcome to a hundred fantastic Portuguese and entrepreneurs now in Portugal from all over the world. You're very welcome on stage. So this is it. Minister, Mayor, can I ask you both to officially, we're going to get a countdown, I believe, open Web Summit. for coming. We'd like to invite you all to Night Summit, which is out on the water just beside Altice. Thank you. Good night.